Welcome back for episode two of Born to Run, The Naked Truth, a broadcast dedicated to examining all the claims, conjectures, and theories I proposed in Born to Run. In this episode, I sit down with Coach Eric Orton to discuss how we came up with the idea of writing Born to Run 2 and its central hypothesis, the idea that you can tune into your body so finely you can tell just by how you feel whether you should change your training, change your breathing, change your diet. Episode two, The Feeling Fix. There's that, that old um, phrase, you know, expect nothing from your running and you'll get more than you ever realize. And it's kind of what has happened with Born to Run. We had no expectation. You and I met in a park in, in Denver. We started to talk. And now 15 years later, it is just snowballed into something much bigger. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. E expectations are a killer. And I, I try to try to avoid them as much as possible and, and switch it to just um, jumping off the cliff, as you say, and you, you teach me how to jump off the cliff and uh, um, you, you're, you're my coach in that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And reckless behavior. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so here's kind of where we're at. With Born to Run 2, we realized that the experiment we started with Born to Run back in 2005 worked, you know, 15 years or so later, the whole idea that you could take somebody, and I mean literally you, could take someone who was broken down, discouraged, always injured, super negative attitude about running, and you said, I can completely change everything about your running so that it's no longer a punishment, it's no longer a pathway to pain, and you can run as much as you want, wherever you want, anytime you want. I didn't believe it, and I thought maybe it will work long enough for me to do this one race, but not, not for a lifetime. There's no way. There's no way you can take a 240-pound guy at age 40 and 45, whatever the heck guy was, and turn him into a long-distance runner. And now suddenly I'm looking around like, hey, 15 years later, holy crap, that experiment worked. And that really was when we realized it's time to write Born to Run too. Yeah, and I, and I think timing's everything. And, and you could argue, well, why didn't we do it right away? Um, I think there's, I don't know, when we first had that conversation about Born to Run 2, to me, it felt just like everything that happened when we went down to the Copper Canyon. Everything just, that conversation, we basically wrote a book in one phone conversation and everything flowed and it just felt right. And I think it, it just, so exciting now to kind of rekindle all of this that's changed both of our lives and now hopefully we can um tap into the readership that felt by what you did in born to run and take these tools to take their run into whatever level they want to take it that's that's exciting yeah and i think the thing for me was you know after born to run came out uh, I was just bombarded by messages from people saying, like, what do I do? You know, what shoe should I wear? How do I adapt to barefoot running? You know, what should I eat? And I'm like, oh, dude, 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 I'm not that guy. You know, uh, I know the guys, but I'm not that guy. I felt like I was still in the experimental stage myself. You know, I, I felt like the guy in the back of the plane, like, hey, the pilot had a heart attack. Can anybody land the plane? Like, all right, you know, I can land it this time. I don't know how to fly. I just got the plane in for a landing and everybody survived. That's where I was when Born to Run came out. Uh, all this was brand new to me. At the time I was researching Born to Run, I'd never been to an ultra marathon. The only ultra marathon I'd ever seen was the one I was actually in. And so this world was still very new to me and I didn't know if it was going to last. And secondly, the other thing about it though, Eric, is that I feel like we have now learned a lot more, you know, things that were theories in 2005 now to both of us feel like fact. Well, and, and that's, that's why I'm a coach is that, you know, I, I love just, just like I believe every runner can continue to get better as, as they get older, there's always a way to get better. That, that's how I view coaching. And that's what I love about my, what I do is that there's always a way to improve upon how I coach. And, you know, you could argue that it, it's maybe taken me 10 years of doing camps 
and coaching people in a lot of different situations to come up with a way for people to truly be coached in how to execute run form. Lead, lead, think about leading with the hips and that's what this will do. That translates to running, even though again, we're not locking our leg out. When we run. That, that's what I'm excited about is that how I matured as a coach, even from your success 15 years ago to now really package this up in the ultimate training guide. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think in some ways this is the dream coach athlete relationship because I would assume it's very rare that someone comes to a coach and says, Hey, can you coach me for a result I want to see in 15 years? You know, people come to a coach and say, Hey, I got this race coming. Hey, I got this problem. It's all relatively short term. You know, here's where I'm now. I need help to get to here. And I'm saying, Hey, can you help me get to, you right. know, here? And right. on top of that, we have such a good uh, friendship that I can tell you, I, I ain't going to do that. You know, like, you know, if a coach says, hey, you should do these five things. And people will privately say, I'll do three of them. I ain't doing all five. I'll sell you. I'll tell you, hell no, man. I ain't doing all five. You better make it two. And I, I think that has created a good working relationship in the way where I become every man. You know, I, I'm all the people out there. Yeah. that yeah. are the real uh, real life case scenarios of what people will really do. And so you know what should be done. And I'll definitely tell you honestly what, what I will do. Well, and, and with that, the psychology of learning how to get you to do something that you don't want to do, but in a way that you will do it, in a way that that's fun. Yeah. And I, that, that was to me, the challenge of what you presented to me with the book of, of how to whittle things down, to make it as efficient as possible, to make it as fun as possible. And that some, the majority of hopefully millions of runners will do. So let's give a perfect example. I, I remember this conversation we were having. So for you, the gospel, the two pillars, it's foot strike and cadence, you know, figure out how to meet the ground with your foot. And how often? And that's really what running is all about. Foot strike and cadence. You, you figure that out, you're 90% of the way home free. But it could be either very complicated or very simple. Most people oversimplify it by saying, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, you run the way you run, your natural gait, don't tamper with it, just buy a different shoe. Or you can super overcomplicate it. You can get a metronome and, you know, figure out exact you know beats per minute and what i was telling you is i don't want to do any of that you know i i don't believe in the fancy shoes but i also don't want to get a metronome and i don't want to measure stuff i don't want to videotape myself and so we pushed each other to come up with a way how can we get everybody to figure out perfect foot strike and cadence in a way that it is impossible to make a mistake and yet it is so fun that you want to do it anyway and that's how we came up with the rock lobster run form fix. Exactly. And, and that's, that was the fun for me of writing this book was those aha moments and that creative process that you and I had back and forth of, Hey, you challenged me to make, do it in five minutes. And I'm like, well, let's get music. And that, that led to, okay, P52s. And rock lobster? It's the perfect 90 beats per minute. So much fed off of that challenge that you presented me and us for the book that is such an ingenious way to teach run form. But more importantly, that, you know, getting back to what you were saying, that so much focus on run form is learning how. Well, it, it takes five minutes. Then you put all the other fun things in play to make it take hold through a lifetime. And that, that's what I think is ultimately accomplish your goal of writing a book that's not out there, that's totally different than any other type of running book out there. And um, like, like we heard in the last podcast, we achieved that. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's difficult because it's so tempting to, to sort of geek up on stuff. You know, that there's always a technology which will provide an answer, provide the input. And what 
what we wanted was get everything by a sense of feel. So if we're talking about people's food, what they should eat, let them feel the difference. If it's going to be foot striking cadence, let them feel it so that when they're out there without their apparatus, without their calorie counters or their metronomes or their Strava watches, as soon as you take a couple of strides, you're going to feel whether your nutrition was dialed in. You're going to feel whether your foot strike and cadence is on point. And that's where the, the rock lobster fix is, to me, is so, is so perfect because we came up with a way where within three minutes, the feeling is now in your muscle memory and the song is drilled into your brain for life. Like you hear rock lobster twice, you can never unhear it. It's there forever. And so even my wife Mika was saying that now, as soon as she runs, it's almost like it's a hypnotic trance. Like as soon as she starts to run, the B-52 start playing in her brain. So when we came up with that, I thought this, this is it. This is the perfect feeling fix. So, you know, it's basically sort of describe, to, 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 to uh, describe to people what it is. We tell people, don't stress about foot striking cadence. Just take off your shoes, stand with your back against a wall about a foot away, and then just run barefoot in place while the B-52s are playing. It's 180 beats per minute. And you can't heel strike because you're running in place. It's impossible to heel strike. And you can't kick back because you'll hit the wall. That's it. So just run in place near the wall. If you find after three minutes that you have strayed from the wall or you've kicked it, that tells you you're either leaning forward or you're kicking back. If your feet are uncomfortable, it's probably because you're standing up on your tippy toes. Your body will naturally relax into the most efficient movement. And, and that's the ultimate coaching. That's mm -hmm. how you coach to create a feeling. Athleticism is awareness. And every elite athlete knows that, but maybe not the everyday runner knows that. And that's from a coaching standpoint, how I coach and how I wanted it to come across is that it's that feeling, creating the feeling so then you can replicate it. You know, we talk about, hey, you're, you're paddling now in the, in the open sea and and you feel a good and bad stroke, right? You know, you, and you you feel it and you adjust. Oh, that was a bad one. So I'm gonna just tweak my elbow a little bit so I can pull that pull that water just a little bit stronger. And that's how running should be. We should be able to feel and and adapt as we go. You know, it's an interesting point. Yeah, since since we moved to Hawaii, uh, I have an outrigger canoe, and an outrigger canoe is the perfect biofeedback device because you take a bad stroke. You're no longer paddling, you're swimming. The boat yep. goes over. Yep. So you learn to focus on balance, on body posture, and how the, um, the paddle is actually meet you, meeting the surface. That's really what running is. Balance, posture, how is your body meeting the ground? Unfortunately, we, we distance ourselves so much from that. You know, you cushion our feet and fix shoes. But before we get down that road, I, I think we should just back it up a little bit and just... Mm -hmm discuss a little bit about how this thing actually happened. So from my perspective, what happened was, you know, you and I met at a park in Denver back in 2004, 2005. And I was like this busted down ex runner. I had seen the title Mata in action. I was aware that I was seeing something kind of amazing, but I didn't know what it, it looked different than running I'd seen before. And then I come out of the Copper Canyon and uh, I get assigned by Men's Journal to come talk to you. And um, you're telling me, okay, here's what you've seen. Here's what it means. And that's where our, our running relationship began. Yeah, it, I, I think, um, you know, I've said this before, you know, I, I was so excited. I should have been excited when we met because you were doing an article on my training, but I was more excited about being the journalist and interviewing you about what you learned at, down in the, the canyons of the, the Copper Canyon. And to me, um, you know, I, I played tons of sports growing up, but my life changing move was when I moved to Colorado. And shortly after that, I started hearing about this tribe that had come to the um, led Bill 100 and to run the 100 mile race. And it was the Harm Taramar Indians. And here I, I was, that's what I want to be. I want to be like them. And here, th this is was something that I could never ever dreamed of. 
happening. And here you that catalyst that I'm meeting in Denver that ultimately led us down the path of born to run that, that changed my life. And again, it was something that I, I could never have dreamed of and, and it's continued to this day. So, you know, we, we had that experience. We, we go down to the Copper Canyon. We're with this ragtag, crazy ass yep. crew. We have the race. I realize that there's a bigger story here. There are a lot of different tunnels to be explored in the whole world of running and about, you know, evolution, physiology, psychology. So pack all that stuff into Born to Run. You wrote The Cool Impossible. I wrote Natural Born Heroes and Running with Sherman. And as the years went by, I was actually supposed to be writing a different book right now. I had a contract to write a book called King of the Weekend Warriors. And that book was actually going to be a response to David Goggins' book, uh, the, the David Goggins uh, sort of mindset that, you know, running should be the test of your toughness, that you should leave nothing out there. You know, it's almost like the Steve Prefontaine thing too. You know, if you not trying your best to sacrifice the gift. And, and I feel like this whole mentality has seized in running that it is, should be equated with, with pain and toughness. And my attitude was, that's the worst mentality whatsoever. Running should be as, associated with joy and community and, and happiness. But if you tell that to runners, you om almost automatically discredit yourself. You know, if you tell somebody, hey, it's a fun run. Well, you know, that doesn't count. If you're laughing and happy, well, that doesn't count. And so I was going to write this book called King of the Weekend Warriors, where I was looking at guys that I knew, uh, men and women, who are super high-performing athletes, yet their attitude is just joyful and fun. They're having a good time, and yet they're performing at a very high level. But I was actually two years into working on that book. But as I was writing it and researching it, something was nagging at me, and I kept thinking, I'm writing the wrong book for the wrong reason. I am not sharing information because I feel like it's what people need to hear and a story that I want to tell. No, I am responding to somebody else. I'm trying to win an argument. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a terrible reason to write a book. So I dumped that book and I thought, okay, what, what is it that I want to share? And that's when I realized, because every day I'm getting this message. I think I opened my inbox and there's like 15 more messages from people asking me for training advice. I'm like, I'm not, and I thought, wait a minute, it's been 15 years. Maybe a time has come to actually share the stuff that I have now proven with my own body works. So I called you up and go, hey, dude, uh, I'm thinking about doing this book. Um, and you're, you're on board. <laughs> no, I, I still remember that phone call. I mean, literally, we, you know, it, it just flowed. We, we essentially wrote that book in 45 minutes. I mean, not literally, but we, we had the core of it. And I think that just, you know, talks about just how I, 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 you know, you're, you're in Hawaii, I'm in the mountains. We kind of come from different perspectives, but we always meet in the middle with that ancestral fitness and performance that we love to share with people and loved, I, I love to learn more about it. So um, I, I just think it's, it's a great partnership and, you know, I, I, I'm just honored to one that you've called <laughs> And, and I, I just feel like this was, a, a, it is a really special book and we, we nailed it. And because of, uh, of, you know, we, we started this podcast with, you know, Hey, we, we don't know what we're doing. Well, what happened when we started writing this book, we went to, we went to California to do a photo shoot, to get photos for it. And it completely changed the whole direction of this book. You know, it didn't, it didn't. What's interesting is, uh, you know, that, that thing where I keep telling you, you know, pushing you to jump a little bit, and we'll figure yeah. it out way yeah. down. But I, I think it's one thing to jump blindly. It's another thing to be pretty confident that you know what you're doing and then jump to test it. And I think that's where we were. I felt like we were on to something and we knew it early on. And the point you made about the ancestral techniques Everything that you and I find interesting and worth pursuing is something that's been around for a long time. Uh, there's nothing that's new that interests me, interests me at all. Even the point of heart rate monitors. I understand 
why a heart rate monitor is an extraordinarily useful tool, but it's a tool. It's a piece of technology. It's a thing we've added. What I like is, well, show me something that's actually been around for 10,000 years. If it was effective for, you know, Caesar's centurions and the Tarahumara, and it's probably effective today. And that's where you and I united was that everything we want to explore in the world of running, if it has a 10,000 year pedigree, it probably works. So I, I think we had a sense of exactly what we wanted to say and how, but the cool thing was we knew we were on a short timeline. So we had to arrange these photos quickly. The photos actually had to come before the book. So we put together this crew, thanks to our friend, Louis Escobar in a nudist ranch in Colton, California, because our friend Pat Sweeney said, hey, yeah, here's a here's a private place you can shoot because, you know, it, it's a nudie ranch. But what was so fascinating was we get these runners together of every age, race, ethnicity, lifestyle, put them together and realize, oh, my God, like this very things we're talking about are true. Like the, the problems we're seeing, they have them. the hopes that we see reflected they have them too yeah and, and and that's i mean that may have seemed new to you but that's that's what i've seen the last 15 years you know uh, and and that that's where i'm excited for this book because regardless of the type of runner that's out there everything in this book is aimed at helping everybody in their own way but our bodies are meant to work one way. And so therefore this is going to build such a great foundation for any type of runner out there. And we saw that in, in Colton, California, there was so many different types of runners there, but they all needed, they all needed something in some way that, that it's going to lead them to, to better running. Yeah. It, it was a fascinating thing to witness because we quickly went from theory to proof right there. So you and I talk on the phone for 45 minutes. Hey, here's our theories. Here's what we're going to put in the book. Here's the free seven. Here's how we're going to approach uh, running dysfunctions. And then a couple of weeks later, we're at this uh, photo shoot and you're putting these runners. There's a you know, non-binary runner. There's an elite mountain racer. There's you know, really good road racers. Uh, putting all these runners through some diagnostic exercises and we're like, holy Christmas, look at this. You know, this person is struggling with glutes. This person has a quad uh, uh, over function. This person has a, uh, a cadence problem. And to the point though, you know, you have like Jenna Crawford, an extraordinarily uh, well-conditioned, really great athlete, yet, you know, glutes have been deactivated. You know, Karma Park, who has an eight-year running streak, has run every day for eight years, yet you've said, man, you said, uh, man, I would love to get my hands on, on Karma's cast. Like, Karma's did. need work. And it was in that moment I realized, wow, the theory we have about how we can help runners, we're putting it into practice right now with these people from all over the country. Well, and that group, was a cross section of every runner out there. The running population is that they they're representative of all the runners out there. And that, again, that's, that's where I'm excited with the book, especially with this function, you bring up dysfunction and injury, you know, we really, really just debunk the idea of it in a lot of ways is that most injuries that we've been brainwashed are injuries in the running community are essentially something that we can rectify and aren't really injuries. It's just something that we can, if, if we understand what's going on, we can take that away. And that's, that's, that's the uniqueness of, of, of this book. That's why, by the way, I'm wearing my Born to Run 2. Yeah. Let me see if original I can cast, baby. The original cast across the back. I don't know if you can read that. Uh, not quite. Rotate, rotate. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be backwards anyways, right? I'm going to pop a hip out. Yeah. Plus, you're born to run buffs. Yeah. I got the full uniform on. Uh, yeah, so the, you know, I think ultimately what it comes down to is I felt like we could create a running book unlike any other book out there because the starting point is not that every other running book out there basically anticipates at some point you're going to run into trouble. If you don't get the right shoes, you're going to get hurt. If you don't do this training, you're going to get hurt. It's always sort of like, Running is this thing you can sustain for a while, but ultimately 
it's like dealing with nitroglycerin. At some point, there's going to be an explosion. And our approach is, is very different, is that you can enjoy this forever. It can always feel better and more fun and easier and freer. It can be easy, light, smooth, and fast if you tap into the free seven. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, that I keep using that word brainwash. And I, I, I'm excited for a lot of runners to feel what running can actually feel like because in a way that they've never, never thought about before. They, they might think tight hip flexors, tight IG band, tight calves, tight quads, all these aches and pains that maybe has, is kind of par for the course because we're runners. We can take that away. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's where I'm really excited for people to start to feel that. Um, that it's like, wow, running can really feel good. And yeah. the more we run, the better we can feel. What a concept. The, every step should be a good one and every step can be a good one and it, it should feel better the more we run. And I think the first step to that is, you know, if we accept this model that running long distances was the first great natural advantage that humans had in the world, if we accept that as a fact, then we're on our way. So the idea was that, you know, uh, 2 million years ago, humans were these puny, hairless creatures. We didn't have fangs or claws or muscles or speed. We couldn't swim very well. We couldn't fly. So every other species out there had a natural advantage except us. And even our brains weren't very well developed back in the, in the early days of our evolution. So what were we able to do that allowed us to survive? Run long distances. You know, we have bodies that are vertical as opposed to horizontal. We have bodies that are designed to spring along, to move lightly. Our bodies are full of elastic recoil tendon. You know, we're, we're tightly wound with rubber inside like a, like a golf ball. You know, we're hairless for a reason because our bodies are covered with sweat glands that allow us to vent heat by perspiration instead of respiration. So a horse, a cheetah, a donkey, they all have to pant in order to cool off. A dog has to let its tongue come out of its mouth in order to cool off. Humans vent heat by perspiration. So this is our advantage. The one thing that allows us as Homo erectus to survive is the fact that we can run long distances. So that, that's an evolutionary fact. We're now taking a second step, which is that, okay, well, this is what we're good at, then it should feel good. You know, if a fish decided, eh, you know, I really don't feel like uh, if I swim too much, I'm going to get hurt. I better go to the, the swim specialty store and learn what to do with my fins or, or I'll get hurt. There'd be no fish. You know, running should be as natural and joyful for us as swimming is for a fish, as flying is for a hawk. So, so what happened? How come we took this thing, which should have been joyful, and now it becomes unpleasant and, and a forced response to our eating? You know, what, what happened? I believe what happened was immobility, you know, our, our ability to conserve energy, you know, by using technology quickly outstripped our, the change to our bodies. You know, we still have these caveman bodies from 10,000 years ago, but now we have, you know, pick this little rectangle up, push a button, and now suddenly nutrition is arriving at my door. I don't need to go out and look for it. I don't have to fight it. It just arrives. And so... A brain which is dedicated to conserving energy at all costs has now met up with a body that wants to use energy and the brain is winning out. So now the question is, okay, well, how do we get back to that early lifestyle, which is healthy and encouraging of running, but in a practical sense where we're actually going to do it in the real world? Okay, folks, now you know why I am so excited about this book and why I was so excited to partner with Chris for this book, because I'll rip off the practical knowledge of the coaching and the training, but then you get an amazing story like that. <laughs> That's this book. Okay. I I'm just sitting here spellbound listening to this story. And that's what you're going to get from this book is that you're going to get all this practical coaching stuff, but then you're going to get an amazing story like that. And um, I, sorry to get off, but that's, that's just, I, I just got a dose of what the book is about. Yeah. Well, then you give me the dose of like, I raised the question, like, well, how can we do it, Eric? So, and then you, and then you tell me how, so yeah. like, like in the first place, so we had this idea that 
there are these seven sources of free energy. So any system that needs to function where it's like do or die, it needs to have multiple backups. So, you know, if, if humans evolve to run, well, you know, the only source of energy just can't be food because what, there's no food, you're, you're, you're toast. There have to be right. multiple backup sources of energy. And so by speaking with you, I realized, okay, well, there are these seven ways of adding energy to the system. And they are, let me see, see I remember them all, the free seven. So it's food, form, fitness, focus, footwear, family, and fun. You nailed it. And all seven of those are not detriments from running. They're actually energy sources. Yeah. I, and and th I love that they're all energy sources that go in, that feed into this running engine that we want. And, um, and, and again, how you pull in the stories of each chapter of the free seven, you know, I, I told you this, I, I go in and read every chapter that you sent me and, and getting inspired by the stories you're telling gave me energy within each seven. So um, it's, it's, that's where the uniqueness comes in with all of this is that this is just one unique book that is going to give so many different runners, so many things to work on, but so many things to think about and, and to really gravitate to joyful running. So let's, let's take a look at one of the free seven. I think, I think most of them are yeah. kind of obvious. Okay. Food, you know, we, we go with yep. the starting point that you need to get food out of the equation right from the start. Most right. people, the motivating force for running is their relationship with food. Uh, most people who run recreationally, well, you know, I want to lose a few pounds. I want to get back in shape or I, I only run so that I can eat wherever I want. If that's your approach to eating and to running, then you're always on a hamster wheel because your running will never catch up with your caloric intake. You will always be sort of chasing that, that weight loss. And it creates this very destructive cycle where, you know, hey, I'm only running to lose weight. I haven't lost enough weight. Therefore, I better run more. Oh, I ate a lot last night. I better run more. And you're not focusing on the running, which means at some point you're going to get hurt. You're running yourself into a point of injury. If you can remove food from the equation, where now I'm running, I'm focused on my form, my athleticism, my enjoyment of it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not running desperately to try to punish myself for pizza. So that's how we start off with food. But um, to me, things like family and fun, people look at those and it seems like the opposite of what you should be getting from an exercise program. Because if you're having fun, well, you're not working. And if I'm out with the family, well, that's just social. That's not really exercise. And so you were the one that actually schooled me on how these two things could really be crucially important to exercise. And, and I think, you know, fun, fun is different for everybody. And I, I think that that's part of the awareness of starting to understand what fun is for you and not someone else. And, but ultimately when we include other people in our running, whether it's at the track or we went to the pioneers and um, trailblazers, you know, on our sneak peek tour. And there was 150 people there working really hard at the track. But then what did they do afterwards? They're breaking out the coolers and they've got the hill and they're dancing. And that's all fun that goes into what, you know, we Kind of that, that will kind of keep us going and, and and give us that free energy in how we want to use our running. And uh, go ahead. I was going to say what's very interesting about pioneers and trailblazers in Boston. They had so much right going on; it was crazy. Number one, yep. this was a group devoted to runners of color. The idea is people who might not have felt comfortable running on their own through the streets. They provided a family for them so that people who might have been apprehensive now feel welcome and supported. Uh, number two, this is a track workout. You know, track yeah. workouts are worldwide devoted to misery, to solitude, solitary effort and discomfort. So what did they do? They created pace groups. So we were doing, was it uh, 440 repeats, right? Uh, right, right. So 440 repeats, but they're broken up by pace. And there's always a charismatic person who was the pace leader who then became the, the sort of the den mother of that pace group who's watching out for people. So suddenly 
your group is now subdivided into a smaller group that's also cohesive. And we're now identifying, hey, you know, we're the 10 minute mile runners. We're, we're a family together. And then as you run, as you're finishing your 440, the faster people are there waiting for you. So they're, they're, they're cheering for you. So, you know, yeah. if you feel embarrassed because you're an 11 minute a mile or runner, you're not going to feel embarrassed because the seven minute milers are, are screaming for you. So they created that sense of family and then fun. You know, there's laughter, there's joy, there's music. They started line dancing. They ordered pizzas. To me, this is the brilliance of a running program based around family and fun. Because I don't think I had more fun that entire week than I did that night. You know, like right. I could not have sat on a, on, a, on a sofa in the evening doing anything that would have felt better than running with Pioneers on, on a Wednesday night. And just the camaraderie. I mean, before and after of, of just mingling with people. And what I liked was that there was actually, we use that word family, you know, kind of loosely, but there were actually families there with young kids following up their, their parents on the track and running and having fun with smiles on their face. And to me, that's what running is all about and how you begin to teach what running can really be to, to the next generation. And, um, you know, so yeah, there, it, it was the, the magic pill all, all bottled up in that one event. And there's something about that idea of family too, which is that, you know, the best way to learn anything is non-verbally. You know, if I'm, if I'm trying to explain to you how to scratch your nose, it's going to take me 10 minutes. It will take your hand, take your finger and put it here and do this. Or I can just scratch my nose and I can show you. And so nonverbal education is far more effective than, than language. And so, I mean, the Tyler Mata know this too, the way, how do they train kids to run? By running with the kids, creating a game where the grownups and the kids are playing together. You know, the original um, hunting packs who went out searching on these persistence hunts, the entire tribe was together. It was a young and old men and women together. And the reason why is because, first of all, you have the inherited knowledge of the older guys. You know what? The men and women, I've been out here doing this for 40 years, buddy. These are the hoof prints we're going to follow, not those. You know, here's how the wind is, is affecting our faces. Uh, our friend Billy Barnett tells a story about Polynesian long-distance paddlers who, who could feel the current <laughs> by the way the testicles <laughs> reacted to the bottom of the canoe. Uh, not something I'm still to the test <laughs> as of yet. But the idea was that the best way to teach people is to do it in a group. So there's that family setting of, of passing along the next generation by demonstrating, but you can also learn yourself. You know, you go out with a better runner. I hear this all the time. People say to me, I'd like to run with you, but you know, I, I'm not good enough. Number one, you definitely are good enough to run with me. And number two, by running with someone who's better than you, you're going to learn by osmosis, by, by inheriting their movements. And I think you strip down maybe the unimportant reasons we run. If we say, oh, I'm not as fast as that person, or I won't be able to hang, all that stuff doesn't matter. If you just go and jump off the cliff, so to speak, and, and be with that faster runner, you're going to experience something much higher and much, something much greater. To me, is more important than all the, all the little things or, or the, the short-sighted part of running. And that's literally for me where the story began. Micah True took me out for a run in the Copper Canyon. I learned from his movement and that got me hungry for more. So here's what we're going to do. Right? Over the next few weeks, we're going to seek out all the people involved in this story, all the people involved in the Free 7 and have conversations with them on camera just like this. And Billy Barnett's the first one, right? Billy Barnett and his wife, Alex Barnett, who, believe me, if you think Billy is a trip, where do you meet Alex? Awesome. All right. More ahead. <laughs> <laughs>